the UNHR Department of One trying to figure out how to balance task and strategy while keeping up with changes in regulatory compliance? Do you need a fresh outlook on old topics? Then stop what you're doing, grab your coffee, and get ready to recharge. If you have people, you have problems to solve and things to do. Your host is Brenda Neckvottle, a 20-year human resource professional, ready to explore the HR industry with veterans of business and life with fresh eyes and new ideas. Learn about the rapidly evolving changes in employment law around the country, as well as new tactics to deploy and build engagement in your workforce. If you're looking to implement new practices to make your job easier in HR, then this podcast is for you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Best Practices in Human Resource podcast. It's another exciting day. We've got all sorts of coronavirus stuff going on, and it's just, it's amazing at what is happening out in the world. If this is your first time listening, welcome aboard. Glad to have you here. Um, you know what? We got a we got a, another pretty cool show for you guys to hear. And if you are returning listeners, thank you so much. Time and time again, um, really, it makes a huge impact. And I know you guys have a lot going on. Um, so if you're coming here to get tips and tricks on how to survive the virus, then uh, look no further because we are loading you guys up with really great information. So I'm here to help you share the what and the how in human resources, and, and I'm in the human business, which means that there's a greater number of dynamics in the workplace to balance and manage. And importantly, most importantly, today we are going to be talking about employment law changes across the nation, and I'm going to share with you later in the show where you can actually get access to these. Um, the main topic today is how today's market impacts employee retirement benefits, and I got a very special guest. Uh, it's we're talking about how these things are impacting now and what may happen tomorrow. His name is David Stevens. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. You'll learn more about him a little bit later. We've got the HR question of the day. And I'm going to share with you some upcoming events and how you can go about getting best practices delivered right to your inbox. Now, before I go any further, folks, the information available through this podcast is for informational purposes only and not for the purpose of providing any form of legal guidance. If you should, if you need some, by all means, go ahead and contact your employment attorney to obtain legal advice with any respects to a particular issue. And if you do not have one, and if you do not have an employment attorney, go ahead and reach out to me, and I may be able to go ahead and refer one to you through our affiliates program over at Jackson Lewis. And trust me, they are busy, <laughs> busy, busy, busy. Okay, we've got, as you can imagine, a ton of headlines going on across the nation. So we are just going to go ahead and get after it here. So first off, I got some information and updates. If you guys are government contractors, the OFCCP is granting exemptions and waivers for new coronavirus relief contracts. The FMCSA has suspended certain safety rules in response to COVID-19 outbreak, including drug and alcohol uh, testing. So you guys are definitely going to want to look into that. Um, over at the DOT, <clears throat> the DOT FMCSA has also issued federal emergency declaration uh, limitation or announcements establishing limited reprieve from driver safety regulations for the coronavirus and the relief efforts. So if you happen to be in that area, definitely take a look at that. The FAA has also issued COVID-19 interim health guidance for air carriers and air crews. The IRS has issued a high deductible, high health plan guidance related to what's going on with the coronavirus. OSHA has also uh, issued guidance on recording and reporting cases of the coronavirus as well. Now, over in California, the governor has temporarily suspended the WARN Act notice requirements for COVID-19 related based circumstances, thankfully. And over in Colorado, <clears throat> they have made some minor revisions to the COMPS Order 36 and provides one month grapes period for posting and notice any type of notice requirements as well. Over in D.C., the District of Columbia has passed emergency legislation expanding coverage under the D.C. FMLA and unemployment insurance piece. And over in Illinois, the Illinois Department of Employment Security, IDES, has issued emergency rules and a summary around that. Or I should say they've issued a summary around their emergency rules. 
Over in New Jersey, the Supreme Court has held that America, <laughs> finally we get to deal with something that has nothing to do with the coronavirus here. Uh, and the New Jersey Supreme Court holds mar- medical marijuana use is outside of the workplace, is protected under state law, and employers are required to accommodate after hour use. I'm sure there's going to be some people that would be really happy about that right now. And the New Jersey uh, coronavirus 19 bills uh, are put in are in the process of being put into place, which would expand employee benefits and establish benefits also for independent contractors. So if you guys are over in New Jersey, you're going to want to definitely keep your eyes out for that. Over in New York City, the Commission on Human Rights has uh, proposed exceptions to prohibitions on pre-employment marijuana testing as well. And Virginia has opened its door to collective bargaining for public employees. And finally, down over in Puerto Rico, I mean, there's a lot that's going on, right? The Senate down there has approved a bill on sick leave uh, pay during the cessation of operations due to the coronavirus, as well as providing emergency leave for pandemic illnesses that uh, those things have been revised as well. So if you guys are in any of those areas, and I know I just like crunched right through all of that stuff. But if you guys are in those areas or if you're in these sections of business, you know, definitely do your research and take a look and see what's going on because these are the types of things that are impacting business. And um, it, it's already complicated enough out there, but these are just those little extra additives that happen in these particular areas. So you definitely want to get on top of that. With everything that's going on with the coronavirus, I've been getting a ton of questions. Uh, I Literally, it has been nonstop, just like it is for everybody else right now. And, you know, we're all trying to figure this out. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring in some more education into the show, uh, particularly for those who are listening um, on the HR front, because this is an area that we're going to talk about today that HR folks in general, unless you actually go and research the information yourself, it doesn't come at you quite a bit. So today's guest is a friend of mine. He is in the investment industry. He's been doing this, this is his entire career. He's very smart. He has some very sound information. And a lot of the things he talks about are some really great takeaway points that you can use and capture to sit down, ask questions, and talk to your plan advisors on what you guys should be doing with things like 401k investments and retirement plans. So. Take a listen to this. Hey folks, welcome back. And I am super excited to have today with us uh, a friend of mine who we get into, we've been getting into a lot of trouble together lately in a good way. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to welcome Dave Stevens to the show. Let me give you a little bit of a background on him. He is he is a former uh, regional vice president for Mass Mutual. Uh, he is currently not only a small business owner, but he is an active investor in the market. And we've just been having some pretty tremendous conversations over the last couple of weeks as we've been watching like everybody else is, is what's going on in the market. And this is a perfect opportunity for folks um, to actually listen to what's going on because as we know, market changes are, you know, they're impacting employers benefits. And so, the employees benefit, excuse me. So this gives us an opportunity to, you know, just kind of chit chat about what we see going on and what we believe is, is going on and maybe some potential recommendations on how you as an employer can, uh, you know, work for things for your employees. I know that wasn't the best intro, but that's all right. We're funny that way. <laughs> we just, we just, we make it work. How are you? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. Good morning. Good morning. It's not, it's a, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting few weeks, hasn't it? To say the least, I've had a lot of phone calls, made a lot of phone calls. And, uh, you know, what's really interesting to me is, is most of my clients that I called were certainly concerned, but the conversation quickly swung to the concern they have for everybody else. Yeah. Like what's going on with the bartenders and the waitresses and the hotel people and the people at Disney. Uh, back in 2009, it was all about their money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I found it to be um, refreshing that although they were concerned about their money, they were also concerned about other people and the impact that it may have on them. So, you know, I think we're in the right spot to recover from this attitude wise. And I talk about that in, in general. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I think so too. And, you know, I mean, for a lot of us that have been in the, you know, been in our careers for 
you know, greater than 10 years, we, you know, we remember what those days were like and we remember the fear and, you know, we're not, we're not far removed from, from the great recession that took place 12 years ago, you know, and certainly the start of it. So I think we've had a, we, we're kind of, a, I think we're in a much different place now emotionally and mentally as it comes to what happens when businesses, you know, suffer times like what we're going through right now, because it's still fresh in our minds. Mm -hmm. I mean, 12 years ago on paper is longer than it is emotionally <laughs> as, as to remembering what it felt like. Well, this particular situation is so unique because what's going on in the market is a reaction to something that doesn't have anything to do with the market in general, right? This exactly. virus. Exactly. A little bit, you know, from the oil pricing. But what I think is unique about it is the first time that certainly in my lifetime that every market has been impacted around the world and every economy has been impacted around the world. But being the strongest economy and the strongest market in the world, I also believe that we have the smartest people to help us recover from that. And that if people can keep from panicking and selling low, that this market will recover quicker than it did back in 2009 when it was market related. Yeah, that's, I think that's something that's very important for people to understand is that we're not dealing with a broken market as a result of a bubble that has popped, unlike what we did with the subprime market, the real estate market, and other things that were contributing factors. This is something different. And the market is, we talked about this last week, the market is doing exactly what it's designed to do. But what's happening is that the response to the environment, not the financial environment, but just our environment as a whole is fear-based. And so people are pulling their money out. Yeah, and I think that <clears throat> the next few days are going to be a significant, um, significant in reference to where the trend in the market is going to go until we find out what kind of federal relief we're going to have and who it's going to go to and how much and how quickly we're going to get it. Unemployment is going to be a big factor in this, right? I was reading mm -hmm. yesterday that it's possible that we could have 47 million people unemployed. I, I have a tendency to take the news with a grain of salt yep. because I don't read that in any other reports that I read. I read the Wall Street Journal every morning and certain financial reports that I have subscriptions to and I don't see that same concern. But again, it's how quickly that we can get stuff back in the market. You know, the lower interest rates helps the banks yes. you know, to trade back and forth. And a lot of people have called me and said, well, does that mean I should refinance my house? And all of those kind of things. And I said, well, it, it really hasn't had a huge impact on that kind of interest yet, unless you have a variable rate mortgage, and then you're definitely going to see some decreases in your payment. Uh, but my experience has been that although the federal government is telling everybody the bank, go to the bank and do what you can do. I haven't also seen the banks in these times, not really release money. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, I myself applied for the, the SBA loan. Uh, just to see if it was as easy and that I could cover my payroll you know, without spending my cash down. Cause obviously there's nobody really rushing to the market at this moment. And I don't think we've seen the bottom, but I, I just really believe that we got to hold on and have faith that <clears throat> these stimuluses are going to impact. We're going to put people back to work sooner than we thought and that we're going to change the curve of this virus mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I feel, I feel confident about it. I, mm -hmm. I would choose to feel that way than the other. I mean, I, I know people that haven't come out of their house for a week um, because they're scared to death of touching anything or anybody. And, and I respect that. But um, this is just not a market issue. And three weeks ago, the market, we're looking at reports and saying, you know, we're still getting 300,000 jobs a week. Mm -hmm. um, in the country that the cash on hand for major corporations is more than it's ever been <clears throat> to the point that the federal government was looking to lower the reserve requirements by banking in uh, because they had so much cash on hand mm -hmm. um, and profits with the major companies. I mean, you know, Amazon and uh, some of the big companies are, are trillion dollar companies, you know, in this last 12 months. 
So it's not the economy that's impacting, it's the virus. And then the, the virus is causing us to have to shut down the economy. So it's a little different than anything that I've ever experienced before, which is why I think patience is a virtue. Yes. And every client that I've ever met, when I ask them, do you want to buy low and sell high or vice versa? They always say buy low and sell high. But yet I've had quite a few people that said, I don't care. I want to sell now. If you're a year out from your retirement, then I would say that you should sit with your advisor, talk about how you might transition mm -hmm. because there's dollar cost, cost averaging, which is where you put money in every month or, or chunks of money over time so that you lower your average cost for your funds. There's also dollar cost averaging in getting out of the market. Yes. That is, is that you take it in chunks or in monthly so that as the market goes up and down, like it has over the last week, um, that you're at least attempting to sell on the good days and the bad days and not just the bad days. So when, co when companies have funds like a 401k or 456 or 457 or, you know, various funds that are out there, this is the same. Are you saying that this is kind of the same mentality that um, organizations that are hired to manage those funds? So let's say like um, Morgan, not Morgan Stanley. I have one TRO price, for instance, they have yeah. uh, several different types of funds and these investors are looking at the same indicators that you and I are on a regular basis. Um, are they thinking along the same lines? Well, yeah. What happens inside of a mutual fund is let's say there's a hundred stocks. Right. If you're aggressive, let's say that they, owe, they you own IBM and Apple and some of those other stocks if you're aggressive, you'll own a larger percentage of those stocks inside your fund. And then the, the less risky stocks and bonds would be the lesser of your investment. Right. And then based on a benchmark that these um, money managers have committed to based on uh, an index, um, they will trade within that mutual fund as much as every day mm -hmm. to make sure that they're trading in and out of the market based on what they see. And that's still going on. Whereas if you had a very conservative portfolio, then the majority of your money would be in low risk and bonds and very little would be in the stock. So your percentages, you still may own IBM and Apple and uh, Amazon, but you would own a lesser percentage of it. So the idea behind it is, is that the traders that are running these, not traders, but uh, money managers are managing those accounts every day based on where they see, is it time to get out? Is it time to get in? Is it to add more? Is it to drop that stock off and replace it with another one? Um, that doesn't happen as often about replacing stock, but um, there's no question that they're trading. Sometimes mutual funds will turn over 100% in a year, which mm -hmm. means they'll sell everything and buy something back uh, in return for it. But most of them, uh, depending on how aggressive they are, determines how often they trade. So, Companies who have, you know, obviously that have these types of retirement benefits, what should they be doing right now? Well, I try to teach my clients to focus on the number of shares that you have and not the amount of money. Mm -hmm. Because even if your stock, if your 401k plan went down and you were still contributing, including the match, mm -hmm. you're buying more shares. So if you look at the two numbers, your, your cash is going down, but your number of shares are going up because every time that you make a contribution, you're buying more shares of what you already own. Right. You're buying them cheaper. And so I was telling somebody yesterday, if you, if yesterday you paid $20 a share <clears throat> and today you pay $10 a share, then for those two shares, you paid $30. But if you divide them by two, it's $15 a share on average. Mm -hmm. You follow that? Yep. So every day or every pay period that you're buying, you're buying at whatever the market's selling it for now which lowers your share value when the market's down. Right. But what you want to do is accumulate a lot of shares so that when you decide to get out, hopefully at retirement, those shares convert to the dollars. And so if you focus on the shares and not the dollars, it's a little more palatable. Yeah. Because your shares don't go down. Like the number of shares don't go down unless you sell something. Right. So every time you buy, you're buying more shares and more shares and more shares. That's a little bit more pleasant to look at because at some point, unless you panic, you're going to sell those shares in the marketplace for what they're currently worth. And hopefully, historically, they're worth more than what you paid for them, particularly 
when you do it every pay period. So as employers are figuring out everything that they need to figure out right now, and there's a lot of that going on. I mean, I, you know, yes, we do have a number of people that are out on, uh, you know, they're furloughed or they're being laid off. Um, but we still have quite a few people that are working in the U S a lot of, I mean, we have this whole new, we have this whole new economy now that has literally come to fruition in the last three weeks and it's named renamed now the work from home economy. Yep. And, um, you know, so a lot of those individuals that have the capability of doing that, they're doing that. What's happening to the labor market right now, it's gone from being an employer, or excuse me, an employee labor market, which means that there's more jobs open than, you know, people have bodies to fill them, to now we're back to being an employer's market. But specifically, it's surrounding essential uh, companies, businesses that are deemed essential. So it's a lot of frontline work. So if you were to research like monster.com or indeed or anything, all you're, you're going to find is a lot of frontline work going on. And for those that are, you know, out on leave of absence, those companies need help. And it's a great way to, you know, kind of supplement your income until the world returns back to right. its norm and, and you're back in your position again. Right. I mean, that's the whole goal is to make sure that you guys are able to survive through this. But, um, for those well, I just saw yesterday that Amazon in our community is hiring delivery drivers. Yes, they are. Amazon and is 15 or $18 an hour or something yeah. like that. Amazon is actually right now focused on hiring over a hundred thousand positions. Mm -hmm. That's huge. I'm going out this afternoon to buy a van. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing going on in my business right now. <laughs> That's awesome. I can see you doing it too. I know you well enough. You're not afraid of getting your hands dirty. Howdy. How are you doing? <laughs> totally get it. So what are some of the conversations that employers should be having with their plan, uh, plan advisors? I think anybody that could study the statistics from dollar cost averaging, that's my safe conversation mm -hmm. is, Back in 2009, when people fled the market because they thought the bottom was never, it was never coming back and didn't get back in until maybe 2010, <clears throat> it took them about eight years, nine years to recover what they had lost. Mm -hmm. The people that stayed in the market and kept contributing and taking advantage of the match and buying everything cheaper recovered all their losses within three or four years. Yeah. Nothing's going to, that, that market is the same as this one, right? The reason that people got out are different, but the market does the same, right? It's very predictable. It's going to go up and it's going to go down and you just can't predict when and how. Right. But I would say statistically staying in the market is the most, is the safest way to go. It's the least amount of risk. Mm -hmm. Although people have such an emotional tie to their money that it's hard for them to do that. You know, I personally got out in October because I was just of the feeling that we've had 10 straight years of great market. And mm -hmm. I felt like I had made plenty of money on my money and that I wasn't, I didn't think that the top was much higher, but yet the bottom could be significantly lower. So I got out in October um, and I follow um, <clears throat> Warren Buffett's theory, which is when everyone else is greedy, He's very fearful, which means eke out another return, eke out yes. a little bit more, just wait, because it's gonna, it's still got some meat left on that bone. And then he says, when everybody else is fearful, he's greedy, which means when everybody runs for the hills because they've taken a big hit and they think, oh my gosh, now it's just gonna plummet. And they sell for a hell of a lot less than they should, then he buys in mass consumption. Mm -hmm. So I figured, you know, the Bill Gates's of the world didn't make their money in the market. They made it in the businesses that they own. Mm -hmm. And Warren Buffett made all his money in the market, right? And so I follow his and I'm saying, I don't need to be any smarter than he is. I mean, he's done really well. If I could just stick to those theories, you know, you buy good, solid companies. You know, I've had plenty of my clients over the last two years that have called me and said, hey, can you buy me some marijuana stock or can you buy me some Bitcoin? <laughs> And I'm like, you know what, that personally, I don't buy into that. So I'm not your guy. Yeah. I like companies that have been around for a long time. I like companies that pay dividends. 
I like mutual funds have had long historical performances, even through the bad markets. So some of the funds that I recommend will never, you're never going to see the home runs, mm -hmm. but on the other end, you're not going to see the devastation, right? They right. kind of play in the middle and, you know, I don't really trade stocks. I'm not licensed to trade stocks. I just trade funds and, uh, you know, set up retirement account. So today I'm setting up a retirement account and I really called yesterday to confirm because I had a feeling that nobody was going to show up. <laughs> but they're like, why would I sign up for a 401k plan now? I would say, you can't do any better than now. Yeah, exactly. Signed up three weeks ago, you would have been really upset. Yeah, exactly. The first contribution you made, you're down 30%. <clears throat> yeah. And you know, and I think that, I think I love what you said about how, uh, you go back to what you're saying about how Warren Buffett's philosophy is, is that, you know, he reigns it in when everybody else is getting comfortable. And, yeah. and that's very true. I mean, if you look at our patterns of behavior, if you take a look at what happened with the great recession back in two, like 2007, I remember specifically thinking there's no way in hell I am ever going to be able to afford a house at these prices that they're being sold, that they're being bought for. Like the home values were going up so high to the point where it was ridiculous. And, and this is when I was living in Richmond, Virginia. I'm thinking there's no way I'm ever going to be able to afford that with what I'm currently making. But, and then I, as I looked around, everybody was, as I call it, being fat and happy. Like we, you know, everybody was comfortable and there's nothing wrong with being comfortable, but there's a problem when being, you're being complacent. Like life is not going to stay this way. And I just saw a lot of people really kind of settling into this mindset that nothing, you know, we're kind of untouchable. Well, th you know, three months later, whammo, you know, the whole, everybody's world was changed. And so I think a lot of people just got smarter from the last time, but even still, we got to a point of comfort. Uh, yet once again, here we are 12 years later. And, um, you know, I think companies have a real opportunity right now to spend time and educating their employees that they currently still have on good money management practices. And not so much the companies themselves as employers educating in people, but bringing in services, you know, like, People like you, you know, have a lunch and learn. Uh, you can do a virtual lunch and learn about what are some really great practices on saving for the future in a down market. You know, how do you, what are, you know, your wide variety of investment opportunities that you can take advantage of now? I mean, what are some other things that you can think of that employers can actually make available to their employees? So that way, when it comes time for the next round, and we should be thinking about that now when the next round of you know financial chaos exists in the world and in our country how employees can be best prepared for that i agree uh, education is is big whether any everybody participates there's always a subject matter um that has appeals to somebody it could be just the difference between why why would you do a roth versus a traditional ira or a 401k right. And what, what's the threshold for where that actually makes sense? The lower you make, the more an IRA or a pre-taxed investment um, benefits you because you mm -hmm. get the tax deduction in the year. If you make a lot more money, and that's a number that you have to determine, um, then a Roth is a better idea. Right. Um, funding college plans, 529 plans, uh, taking advantage of HSA, you know, because yes. you can put pre-tax dollars in there and you can invest that money if you want to. Yep. Um, there's some really good things that could be taught by employers to educate people about how money works because that there, there, most people do not really understand how money works. No, they and don't. The compounding of it and the impact of bad decisions. Yeah. We're great at knowing how to spend it. <laughs> oh, yeah. And even make it. <laughs> We're great at knowing how to spend it. I think I read an article last month in the wall street journal that the average 50 year old had less than $80,000 in their retirement accounts. So if you looked at a 4% withdrawal rate, that's not enough to live on. Mm -mm. And social security. I mean, every time I read something, I'm looking at changing the social security rules. I mean, we just changed the minimum distribution requirements from 70 to 72. And I'm sure that's a to keep people working. And you're referring to age on that one, right? Yes, right. Yeah.
Right. At, at, at 70 and a half, you're, you have to take your IRA or 401k money and there's a percentage of it um, that you have to get out to pay the taxes on it, i.e. I, the government. And that's just been moved to 72. And I've been listening over the last couple of weeks, politicians talk about the situation that Social Security's in and they're going to move Social Security age out. I don't know that they will. That's a tough subject matter at the moment, but um, pushing Social Security out so you have to wait longer to take it. Right. So you move the retirement minimum distributions and the Social Security out, you're forcing people to work longer, which puts less pressure, <clears throat> you know, on the government to fund Social Security. Because right now, it's the first time we've ever had more people drawing Social Security than paying into it. And that's why the balance is going down and we don't have any way to put it back in because we're taking out more than we're putting in. Yep. And it's starting. I mean, a lot of people have advised that we're not going to have social security. They advised that, you know, 15 years ago. Yep. And, and here we are now because we had such a large, you know, boomer age um, that they're putting in and, you know, gen, my generation is going to be impacted by that. I think there's a pretty good chance that the millennials and Gen Z are going to be able to help funnel back up again. But um, I don't think nowhere near what it once was. And, um, you know, my gen, you know, Gen X, we're, we got to figure it out for sure. But So what are some other things do you think would be a good idea for, uh, like if an employer was looking for an opportunity to provide education for their employees, what are some other options that they can consider? Well, I, I, mean, I think it's important to know how a mutual fund works, mm -hmm. right? I think it's important to know how an IRA works. I think you should know more about what a bond is. It's mm -hmm. interesting to me that people know what the word is. But they don't really understand the difference between municipal bonds and government bonds and corporate bonds and why you would buy one or another. Every single day, you're going to find out, you turn on the TV and they're going to say the treasury note, 10-year note, 20-year note. And people are like, I don't even know what that means. Like when the market goes down 10% uh, or a thousand points, for instance, in your 401k plan, that's probably three or 4%, mm -hmm. right? But nobody knows how to translate that and it's not easy to do, but it doesn't affect your 401k or your IRA, anything, any kind of mutual fund, it's not going to affect you as much as a individual stock would. Like when they're talking about individual stocks, Amazon's up, IBM, Disney's down. Right. You may, in a mutual fund, you may only own 4% of your overall portfolio in Amazon. Right. Or 12%, but you definitely don't own 100%. So if Amazon went down X number of points, it would be a fraction of what you would learn. And I think if people would sit in those classes and make it simple and not too much at one time, so people walk away going, you lost me after the first 30 minutes. <laughs> then I think yeah. it would be good. Yeah. The impact of credit cards and high interest rate. You notice uh, when, when the banks got lower interest rates, credit card rates didn't go down. Nope, they did not. And, right. and here's the other thing too. A lot of people don't know that mortgages are, mortgage rates are actually, they're not tied to what the Fed is reducing. They're, they're exactly. tied to the 10 year note, the 10 year treasury. And so, you know, that's why when, when you said earlier, and you called it out perfectly, that when the government, when the Fed reduced the interest rates, everybody expects that the interest rates on mortgages go down. Well, that's not how it's tied directly. When the 10-year Treasury note moves, that's when interest rates and mortgage moves, right? Either it goes up and down, and they correlate with one another. So I think that's a really good subject, too, is, you know, People can look at, you know, every, a majority of people will invest in a home at some point in their life, Absolutely. right? Unless, unless you're somebody like me where I have, it doesn't benefit me because I'm, I'm single. I've been single for a while, sometimes by choice, sometimes bad, but, <laughs> but it doesn't make sense for me to own a home because who am I going to will it to? Like, right. you know what I mean? Or I'm not going to invest in something if I'm going to live in it as an investment opportunity, if I'm in a good place that's well taken care of already, it, you know, so I just, I stay liquid, which makes it, it works for me because then it frees up my disposable income, right? That's a decision, but that's a, that's an educated decision as well. And one yeah. of my best friends is constantly, he says, you really need to buy a house. You really need to buy a house. I'm like, dude, I live 
in a beautiful area right by the water in rent controlled in a brick building that's been around since 1906 that is hurricane proof and because I'm on the same grid as the VA hospital we get our power back sooner than anybody else right why would I want to move <laughs> Well, and you've got the freedom to pick up and go if you want to. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, you know, that that's a that's an educated determination. But I think these are the kind of this is an opportunity right now to start educating your employees during these downtimes. It keeps it keeps motivation up. And although people are freaking out about money and like you may come in, let's say, for example, hypothetically, you were contracted to come in and do a a lunch and learn, a virtual lunch and learn on, you know, how to make the most out of your investments. Well, you have a section of your employees that are going, well, I can't do that. But you know what, if people like you were to talk to employees to say, I understand you can't do it right now, but here's the thing. This isn't going to last forever. This is pain is only temporary. <laughs> but what comes next is how are you going to deal with getting out of this as part of your personal recovery? How are you going to better yourself coming out of this once the pressure is off your shoulders, right? And I think people, this is a perfect time to start thinking about that. Well, there's opportunity out there if, Absolutely. if you're not the doom and gloom person. And if you are, nothing's going to change that. But I would be optimistic about the fact that the market, relative to the market, all the other stuff, you know, is out of our control. Yeah. Until the government decides that it's safe for us to go out and back to our lives, we're subject to whatever happens, which is why I feel like this, as I said right out of the beginning, the next two weeks are going to be significant in how quickly we recover and what way we yeah. recover. If, this, if, the, if the two parties can't get together because they're fulfilling their own uh, agenda, when they've already told people nationally that in two weeks you should see a check and now we can't get a check because they can't come to terms. So that's, that's another week. Now it's three weeks out. I mean, most people who live uh, on that margin of paycheck to paycheck don't have the resources. It, th it does things like car repossessions. It does people mm -hmm. like getting fine on the credit cards. It, versus people to compromise on their mortgages. I've had two or three people call me and say, how do you go about getting your mortgage deferred? And I'm like, I can't help you there, but you got to call them and ask them. And one yeah. actually called and the, the bank said, absolutely, we'll give you 30 days and we'll send you some paperwork to extend it longer than that. We're here to help you. I, yeah. I thought that was great. Yeah. So those options are out there, calling your credit card companies, calling your auto finance people and say, look, Things are tough, man. What provisions do you have? I don't want to be delinquent without you knowing about it. Because if you call beforehand, there's a good chance that they will work things out for you, at least what they would consider to be reasonable. If you don't, you're going to be delinquent. Yeah. So pick up the phone and call. She said it took her an hour on the phone to get in touch with somebody because she kept getting hold, 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 but she didn't give up. And uh, she got her mortgage deferred for the month of April. It's probably the best hour she spent all week. Oh, yeah. She called me later and said, man, that was so easy. I just had to ask somebody. She goes, I was so afraid. <clears throat> and they said it won't affect her credit and all that kind of stuff. All they do is tack it on to the end. Yeah. But, I mean, we're in times where certain lenders are aware of that and have made commitments to help the people that want to help themselves. If you choose not to call, then you're delinquent. Because they don't know that you're one person that's struggling, and so you just chose not to make it. Yep. And I think I think it's just, I think, see, those are key things that employers can do. It's just like, you know, we, as an employer, look, we can't, as companies, tell our employees what to do with their money. We can't serve as an advisor. It's, you know, it, ethically, it's incorrect. And not to mention, like you said, most people don't understand money, so why would we put ourselves in that situation? Um, we don't want to take on that risk of saying, well, if I were you, I would invest in 401k in this way. We can't do that as an employer. But you know, what we can do is we can help educate people on what best practices are on money management from people like you who are in a position that this is what you do. Like, yeah. watch this guy's show. Tune into this on YouTube. Here's a resource. Here's a website. Check it out. You know, what are the top 10 ways that you can save your credit, you know, during this time thing, right? There's a, there's a number of 
tips and best practices that employers can filter out to their employees so long as it comes from a credible service and a credible individual like yourself. Um, and all you're doing is you're, you're demonstrating a couple of things. One, you're showing that you, you really do care about your team and that's very, and that's vital. That's absolutely vital. They also recognize that their employers are doing everything they can under a really crappy situation to make the best of it. And it, it maintains a level of engagement. I mean, you're not going to have people like, you know, blowing up balloons and throwing you a ticker tape parade, but you know what? They do appreciate it deep down, even though they're frustrated. And they won't forget that because you, even though even though it wasn't the happiest times, but they people will never forget how you make them feel. And yes. so being able to you know provide mm -hmm. really great information is one you're helping you're you're doing more than what you can to help people out, but two, it really does make a difference. And your you know your team will be a little bit more loyal to you. And you know what? Look, money matters. At the end of the day, it's the one thing that probably matters more than to somebody than anything else. Well, I would certainly put my name out there to volunteer to talk to some folks. Oh, that's perfect. Not that was my first time through this, and uh, I I'm in the market just like anybody else. I have a job just like everyone else. I have bills just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And when the market goes down, I lose just like everybody else. Yep. And so I am very optimistic cautious but optimistic and i think sometimes just asking for the help because there's somebody that can that can help you if yep. you ask for it. if you don't ask for the help and you try to make your own decisions and they're not educated ones then you put yourself in harm's way there yeah, are all absolutely. kinds of programs all kinds of programs as i said i i applied for an sba loan it took me half the day because there were so many people online i guess that every time i would click a box it would just spin and spin and spin and then that box would and so I would shut it down for a bit and then come back and start all over again. So I did it over the evening and then the next morning to finish it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if, if I'm going to get one, but if I do, I, I know where to put it to use. I want to make sure that my employees get paid. Yep. In fact, I was thinking about it yesterday, like paying my employees like three months in advance just to let them know that, Hey, that's what this is for. And it's not for me, it's for you guys. And uh, instead of paying a monthly, just give them a couple, three months in advance. Everybody in my office is working from home. I'm, I'm actually probably one of the only people in the office because I came here. Because <clears throat> working from my house is not fun. <laughs> my wife yeah. seems to think that I can paint a room with her or, you know. So I'm like, I need to go to work. <laughs> I need to go away from you. I right. love you. Goodbye. <laughs> I played like six rounds of Chinese checkers and I'm not very good at it. So. <laughs> oh my God. It does feel like we're back in like the seventies and eighties again, doesn't it? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, at least we have more than three and four television channels and, but yeah, that's crazy. My wife well, and I started with the six foot rule. Now we're the six yard rule. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, listen, how can people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you some more? Um, my cell phone number, which you're happy to, I'm happy to give, is 757-434-0656. Again, my name is Dave Stevens, and my email address is dstevens, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S, -E -E at financialguide.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for spending the time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. I always love talking to you. Yeah, we'll talk later. Okay, bye. All right, so we've got some announcements for you guys. We've got some things that are coming down the pike that may be of interest to you. Um, for those who have been following me know that I have recently been contracted to provide, uh, to lead webinars on a website called trainhr.com. And we've got a couple of dates and a couple of topics coming up. So March 27th uh, is, the arrival, is a webinar I'm putting together called The Arrival of the Coronavirus in the Workplace. Um, also, the next one following that is Wednesday, April 1st, which is the Employer's Playbook for the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. And that we're going to talk about what's going on with the, all the 
changes in the laws and some best practices that you guys can do uh, to help navigate through all that. Uh, thir Tuesday, April 7th is managing a remote workforce through the coronavirus pandemic. And Friday, April 10th is preparing for a reduction in your workforce. So more is going to be posted on the bestpractices.work website and is going to be found under the dedicated coronavirus webpage. And again, that's the bestpractices.work website under the coronavirus webpage. Now, I love your questions. I love when I get HR related questions and I would love for you guys to send in your questions on, regarding any of this stuff, right? It doesn't even have to be on the coronavirus. It can be on other things. You can submit your questions on the bestpractices.work website and by clicking on the podcast link from the menu down towards the bottom of that page is a submission form for you to go ahead and post your question, which may be read and answered on an upcoming episode. So one of the questions that I have seen a lot surrounding what's going on with the coronavirus and with the emergency leave uh, pay that is uh, going to be taking place is can we put our employees under the new emergency leave pay before April 2nd? So um, my answer to this is I would not put anybody or assume that you can pay anybody under the Emergency Leave Act under that uh, segment of the law until April 2nd. And the reason why I say that is that in the act itself, in the new law that came out, um, it is very clear as to when that law goes into effect. So if there's any form of legal issue or somebody goes to put a claim, that means that that's when the, that's when the clock starts ticking, is that it's supposed to be made available on the 15th day once this, uh, this law was passed which is April 2nd. And that's when the clock starts as to when it starts counting, an employee's time off can start counting. So if you do it sooner, I think you might be out of luck if somebody tries to you know, push some form of challenge against the company because technically it is supposed to start effective April 2nd. Now, over the last several weeks, you guys have heard me talk about the Next Gen Women in HR community. We have been even more busy than we have before. So there's a lot of really great information out there. We've got a, we got a really, man, we got such a strong crowd in this group and, and absolutely love it. Um, a lot of a focus and a lot of attention on staying connected and supporting one another is in the Next Gen Women in HR Facebook group. And that's a great place to start. And if you're in a position where your coronavirus stuff is kind of leveled out and you need some additional HR resources, well, we have also have the, uh, the Next Gen Women in HR Best Practices uh, membership site as well. And that's where there's exclusive information in there. Um, it's all of the places, all the things that you can go to to get the information in order to do your job. And that's something that I'm continuing to build and grow and develop as well. So if you want to join us, by all means, go ahead and feel free to do so. You can find us on Facebook at the Next Gen Women in HR Facebook group. But before you come in, when you knock on the door, it's going to ask you for three questions. And those questions need to be answered in order for you to come into the group. And part of the reason is, is because we want to make sure that those who are coming in really are in the field of HR. And those individuals that are coming in are, you know, this is where they want to be. This is what they want to do. So it is a moderated group, which means that um, we do stick to our rules and those types of shenanigans that go against the rules, individuals will be escorted out. The good news is that we haven't had to do that yet so far. Everybody is in here is awesome. Uh, they're, we got a really strong, engaged group of people. They're asking phenomenal questions, and it's just, it's just a really great place to be. So you can follow me. Not only can you see me in the group because I'm in there every single day, you can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Best Practices in HR. You can follow me again on Instagram as Brenda the HR Lady. You can find me over on YouTube and LinkedIn at Brenda Neckbottle, and my last name is spelled N-E-C-K, like the thing you want to choke. V is in Victor, A-T-A-L. And again, you can find me on the website at bestpractices.org, where if you click connect at the top of the page, you can get my best practices delivered directly to your inbox. So folks, I want to thank you again. Um, I know this has been kind of like a get to the point kind of episode, but you know what, right now, 
it's just crazy times, crazy stuff going on, and everybody is shuffling and juggling and doing everything they can to get through it. But remember, most importantly, take time for yourself. You really, really have to do what you need to do in order to take care of yourself, because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of everything else. So take my advice on that one. Disconnect, get some time off, enjoy the downtime, reconnect with your family, take the opportunity to read a book, just take time for you, get out and away from the technology after you listen to this. So you guys have a great one and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.